Well, welcome everybody. It is the second Alpha Beta talk brought to you by Alpha Collective. Now, Alpha Collective is a Web3 business focused on the business of Web3. We walk our talk. Our vision is to usher in the era of community capitalism. Our mission is to help onboard the next billion wallets via the next billion brand dollars. Easy, right? In season one, we will roll out IRL events, monthly vertical masterminds, weekday virtual coffees in our collective cafe, and our flagship product, 52 Alpha Talks, delivered by 52 Alpha Talk speakers, 26 male, 26 female, or those who identify as such. But to get the ball rolling, we are proud to share 13 additional rock stars who will deliver 13 Alpha Beta Talks over the next 15 weeks. They're free as part of a preview period, but from Labor Day, they will be members only. You can purchase your membership pass via credit card. Remember those, the plastic things, at alphacollective.xyz or while stocks last, there are 19 left via crypto at mint.alphacollective.xyz. They are one ETH, which if you do the math is less, than $2,500, so there is a bit of a price break. Take advantage. But now, on to our second Alpha Talk speaker, Emmy-nominated leading voice around digital culture and emerging trends, Shira Lazar took the internet by storm with her web-first news brand, What's Trending. She's spoken at conferences including South by Southwest, VCon, NFT NYC, and NFT LA, and was named Fast Company's Most Influential Woman in Technology and recently featured on NFT Now's NFT 100 Most Influential List, The Rainbow Room on Top of the World in New York City. Shira is also the co-founder of PeaceInside.Live, a wellness community and platform offering virtual classes, workshops and retreats. PIL is constantly working to break down the barriers of entry to make tools for well-being accessible for all via Web3 community experiences and innovative workplace programs. So if you want to know who's doing anything about it, Shira is doing something about it. Lazar is a Webby Awards honoree, Streamy Awards and IAW TV winner for Best Web Series Live Host. She was Huffington Post's Woman in Tech to follow on Twitter honored on the Variety Woman of Impact list and Synopsis Top Woman in Digital. A digital trailblazer. Have you not got that uh, message yet, the memo? She speaks at conferences around the world, is a regular contributor on the Huffington Posting and entrepreneur and has appeared frequently on networks like Cheddar, Bloomberg TV, CNN, Fox News Channel discussing internet culture and digital trends and now she is here in the studio. Shara, welcome to uh, Alpha Collective's Alpha Beta Talks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And thanks for what you're building. I'm excited to get in and talk about my experience in Web 2, moving into Web 3 and the intersection of what I see the future between digital culture and also our mental well-being. That is amazing. Just shout outs from uh, Bez and uh, Jen. So said, glad to see you. I thought I was missing out. Uh, no, you're but... here. Thank you for being here. We love to see your comments. I do, at least. Yeah, they are coming, oh. but I am going to disappear into Bolivian. It never gets old to use that line. Uh, Shira, uh, take it away and I will see you uh, in about 15 minutes. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. This is actually a very unique presentation because I don't typically do slides or presentations. So <laughs> um, this is an exclusive experience for you all. Uh, I am Shira Lazar. 
Um, these QR codes bring you to my weekly newsletter called The Alpha, which brings you the top news in Web3 and AI curated by me as well as access to really cool events and experiences that I get invited to. And so as uh, as was mentioned, you basically heard my whole Wikipedia and bio, but I've been in digital culture for two decades. And in many ways, uh, it wasn't necessarily a choice. When I um, started out in LA, and you could bring up me bigger, but you should definitely um, scan that QR code. <laughs> <laughs> you should bring it side by side. Um, you know, when I came out to LA, I uh, came out because I wanted to be in media and at the time, not to age myself, but, you know, I, you would either produce for a traditional media company. And the, in my case, I wanted to get into broadcasting. I looked at icons like Katie Couric and Ryan Seacrest and Oprah um, as individuals that I looked up to. But at the time in media, you could either work for a local news station, work your way up. And so you'd have to start it in a small town, which was definitely not me because I'm a city girl. Uh, or you would audition for E or MTV and get those jobs, which are few and far between. And so while building my sizzle reel, because again, we didn't have social media when I came out, I started meeting different people in LA who were needing hosts, but specifically for websites they were building. And this is the beginning before YouTube. And so it was quick time videos. And uh, for me, it was a great way to practice my craft and get hired. And what I found is uh, these entrepreneurs had, had these websites and what I was seeing as this new community emerging really applauded and acknowledge people for the care and enthusiasm and hard work, which is not what I saw, as we know, in traditional media sectors where you had to work your way up. There's a lot of nepotism. And I found like I really thrived in those environments that bridged my creativity, understanding of media and entrepreneurship, innovation and disruption. Of course, that was digital video at the time. And at the time, I thought, okay, this is just something I'm interested in. This is a one-off. What I didn't realize, now looking in hindsight, I see that was actually a, a consistent recurring theme um, of my life and of my career, being able to look at emerging trends and look at emerging movements and cultures and how we're using technology in that uh, to build and tell stories. So that led me to being the first ever vlogger, blogger at CBS News, where I came up with what's trending. Of course, at the time, didn't realize we were in the Web 2 era, even in Web 1, didn't really realize that these become kind of like insider sayings. Uh, but I was always really uh, curious about how you use digital culture as a means of uh, connecting to the media and telling stories and more in the pop culture realm. I was doing that for CBS News. I started interviewing viral video stars. What I noticed, and this is kind of goes back to finding the space, the gap, the, the uh, blank space. And I, I posted about this uh, in an interview with Drew Barrymore that I did, where what I saw happening, and as I was being kind of told what to look out for, for my own career, people said, you got to find your beat, you got to find your niche, you got to find your focus. We all hear that in all different industries. And so as a broadcaster, that would be either entertainment news, politics, et cetera. And I was just not into any of those as much. And even for tech, I wasn't necessarily into tech reporting, like reporting about the specs and the pixels and the processors. Uh, but what I found fascinating was the culture of moving, or emerging from these spaces. And so what I noticed in finding this blank space, white space, was that I, I noticed that people were starting to get covered, viral video stars. People were starting to interview them um, in a blog. It was in, written, right, in an article, or they ended up on morning shows or um, evening shows or like the nightly shows and late night. Um, but this happened weeks later. And so I started getting the exclusive. And that's kind of how What's Trending emerged, where I started becoming the go-to to interview these viral video stars. I then approached VidCon, which was uh, like, you know, if you know VidCon now, it started out in a basement at a hotel <laughs> and now it's at the Anaheim Convention Center. Um, that really inspired What's Trending where I started seeing the response to the videos where you would Google and search on YouTube for this viral video. And my interview came up first because I got the exclusive before 
the TV shows. Now the TV shows get the exclusives for everything, for TV, for online, but they didn't know better at the time. And so little Shira was getting the exclusives before uh, Jimmy Kimmel and the Today Show or even Ellen DeGeneres. And so as I saw those videos of mine going viral alongside the viral video, I said, wow, I think this is now the time to create, you know, a show around these, these people, these influencers, these thought leaders who are emerging from social media, YouTube creators, you know, Twitter stars at the time, Twitter was around still then. Um, it had its break and then it came back for Web3. Um, and we created What's Trending, which was very much like the first uh, talk show for the internet by the internet. It wasn't like big media saying, this is what we think is cool. Um, we ourselves were passionate about the space. We understood how to build community. And we said, we want to be the purveyors of cool, the culture curators. Um, and so we built a live show um, and it was one of the first high quality live streaming shows. We had partnered with CBS news on it and, uh, and then it grew from there. Um, it didn't stop with CBS news splitting up with CBS news, which ended up happening, um, ended up throwing me into entrepreneurship and we ended up, uh, doing big deals, uh, like with YouTube going live daily. And then later on with headline news, which is, uh, you might know as part of CNN, um, and then even building series for VH1. It went from a show to more of a digital media company and uh, publisher. And we got a lot of attention for it, got nominated for an Emmy, won multiple awards, which is really great and sounds really cool. But you can imagine um, there's a lot of ups and downs as a founder in a startup in digital media in a landscape where uh, revenue changes all the time. The minute you figure out a model, the model changes. <laughs> and that led me into a lot of highs, which were great when we were on a high and we were making seven figures and I was part of that and behind that, yay, go me. But when what's trending would you know, possibly lose a deal or just changes would happen, and we went to all back to square one, ground zero. You could also imagine I took that on too. And I think that goes back to the theme of when you start something, or even now, this day and age, our identities are so connected to our brands or our companies. And how do we create some space between them to really uh, figure out who we are and also know that whether our companies and whatever is public facing wins or loses that we as a person are okay, no matter what. And I think when you can do that, you can then better approach the things you're creating um, instead of taking it so personally and taking that heavy load, which ends up restricting your creativity and abilities anyway. So Web2 was building what's trending, getting this acclaim, being a pioneer, which led me to, as I mentioned, peaks, valleys, and even Everest. Yes, see how that works. Um, I ended up on my own little eat, pray, love journey. <laughs> um, even before Everest, I was I was finding myself in a bit of a minor depression and having lots of anxiety with my company, which hands up if you're one of those, you are not alone. And I said to myself, what's the point of doing all this if I'm going to be just constantly stressed out? Like, this isn't sustainable. I can't live like this. And it led me on my own personal growth journey through books, workshops, therapy, and a trip to Everest Base Camp, um, which is uh, 18,000 feet. Is it feet? Oh, my God. 18,000. <laughs> my like 18,000 feet up. Yes, that's it. Okay. And, um, as you can imagine, it was a life changing journey mentally and physically. And it was at Everest and, and I had a friend, Jordana Reem, who was leading this, um, that I started trying to figure out how I bring kind of my excitement for this type of stuff, this type of living into my work. A lot of times we tend to put this part of ourselves behind the scenes, right? And that's fine if that's what you feel. But for me, I thought, well, if, if I love my work and it's so part of me, why aren't I bringing all of me to the table and how do I do that? And in the end, what I realized is, um, what's trending, you know, I started at, at in my mid late twenties, I was now in my mid late thirties, <laughs> 
I just turned 40 and who I was when I started witch training is very different than who I am now. However, yes, it's feet. Everest base camp. I'm not, I wasn't at Everest, the top, the base. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to take too much credit, but it was still hard. It was a 10 day trek in the Himalayas. Uh, but I think that in the end it goes, uh, it goes back to, you know, you can create something and it's really hard to let go of it or let go of the idea of what we thought would be if it's not there. So for me, it was how do I make what's trending work for me versus me work for it, which meant getting support, getting someone to run the company, incentivize that person day to day uh, while I got to continue working on myself and growing because um, I would end up being a better boss, a better leader. If I was going to continue doing what I was doing the way I was doing it, I was going to end up unhappy and resentful, which does not ha help anyone. Um, and also in, in connecting to the things that I cared about and I wanted to bring to the world, it expanded it expanded me completely. And I started doing videos with my friend Jordana around uh, shifting your mindsets. And that led us to creating uh, Peace Inside Live, which I just shared the next slide. So during COVID, uh, Jordana, my co-founder, had been doing offline retreats, was stuck in Thailand. I was in Los Angeles and ended up doing a virtual retreat, which at the time was very unique uh, <laughs> because no one had been using Zoom yet. Of course, we know how that went. And uh, it was really cool to see how you could bring these different modalities and sessions and facilitators from around the world to people through um, this virtual experience. After doing that, um, she came to me with this schedule that in many ways looked like a TV schedule program with each day of the week in different classes. And I go went, wow, this is so cool. You know, who are you doing this with? And she goes, I don't know. And so I said, I want to do this with you. And in many ways brought my background in community organizing and building and media experience to Peace Inside Live and building a virtual wellness studio. So in 2020, we launched, um, as you can see, we started getting press uh, from Stuck Inside to Peace Inside uh, and helping people find Peace Inside literally and figuratively. And it was really cool to finally take something that I personally loved and bring it to the world, having the courage to do so, not waiting for someone to give me permission to, to do it. And in many ways, it was very much like how I started Watch Trending. So while people might say to you, and this is another theme, you know, oh, everything is so different or like, wow, you really jumped the gun or you really are doing something new. I would just ask you, are you? Because a lot of times our skills from our previous businesses bring us to where we are now and you're using them, but in a different way. And that actually allowed me to launch this versus saying that the skills, my experience don't matter now. That's just not the case. Like everything you do, where you've been does matter. It makes you, you, that knowledge, that wisdom. And so I was able to take what I knew from building a digital media company uh, to this. We had thousands of people through our workshop, um, our workshops and classes over 2020. And then even us as founders got burnt out. And instead of me continuing to push and go like I did with What's Trending, I was able to kind of take the tools that I learned in terms of what felt good and not good and burnout for me, say, let's stop down. Let's kind of check ourselves. Are we done with this? Was this a one-off thing, which is fine to let that go. It's a chapter. Nothing is supposed to be forever. Or is that we're not approaching it in a way that's sustainable? Another theme. These are all kind of lessons, whether you're in Web3, Web2, but I think that, and what we'll get to is the more we're immersed and integ integrated into tech and tech into our lives, the harder it gets to make these decisions and creating that space for ourselves to choose into how we want to live our lives. Um, and so we started working with a, a, with a lot of brands. Capital One, Boys and Girls Club of America, Spotify, and bringing customized wellness programs to them. And if you are a brand or a company, let us know. We'd love to talk to you. But that actually led us and me to Web3. Web3, the industry based on the blockchain. It wasn't even something I was using Web3 at the time. Uh, I was looking at crypto, obviously. I was looking at NFTs. And then, of course, this phrase Web3 emerged as something that encompasses all of it, even though it gets a bad rap because of the headlines and what we've seen happen with certain companies. 
I still do believe in a future based on the blockchain and the tech around it. And uh, I'm still inspired by that, as well as the idea of ownership in the creator economy. Um, so again, took what it, it excited me in the past. I was early creator economy days, disruption from traditional media models. And wow, um, falling into Web3 and the creator economy 3.0. <laughs> uh, and not only now did I find myself looking at how it could shape the creator economy and artists and online video creators or business people of all kinds and entrepreneurs, but specifically, oddly enough, my, my wellness company, which was my attempt to escape digital culture because I felt so overwhelmed by it, disillusioned by it. I felt this influencer uh, whole thing was getting really superficial and gross. And so I said, maybe I don't even want to be in this anymore. I want to maybe start a yoga studio. I don't know, like live in the middle of nowhere. I think like a lot of us felt during COVID. But I had this aha moment where I said, maybe it's not about one extreme or the other, but bringing them together. And so Peace Inside started getting hired by NFTs to bring wellness into their Discord. We then started playing with what wellness looks like in the metaverse, uh, what wellness looks like in a Twitter spaces. And so it was really about meeting people where they are and using tech to power that, to be inspired by it, because guess what? It's not going away. So how do we um, make our modern lives, our digital lives, um, approach them in a more conscious, ethical way that works for us? And that becomes more sustainable for our businesses and ourselves as individuals. And so here's some, you know, as you can see, some headlines that popped up um, as I dove into Web3 as an individual and then also with my uh, my own businesses. Um, and it became more and more important and obvious why we should be focusing on this or why I should be focusing on this. I became more and more passionate as I continue to see my own mental health being impacted um, right now, today, and also by social media. And the stats show that this is happening. Um, these are just some statistics that um, show the, the harsh reality of where we're at. It's not just because it's a trend. It's not because things are being just necessarily destigmatized. This is real. We are in a mental health crisis. COVID definitely um, exasperated it, but it was already there. Um, a 2021 study showed that one in every three Americans reported serious loneliness. That's crazy in a world where aren't we so connected, but are we? Um, more than 15 million Americans struggle with mental illness. One in five young people, 13 to 18, will develop mental illness in their lifetime. Youth depression has risen. There was a crazy stat of uh, young girls, 11 to 14, highest rates of suicide, di directly correlated to definitely social media. And, you know, this has been shown in research, the relationship, not just for young people and teens because of their brains being malleable, not fully developed, but even adults. Um, it's linked our social media usage to poor sleep, depression, anxiety. And guess what? Web3 doesn't make it any better. Um, as tech is more integrated into our lives, I don't know if it's going to get better or worse, but we see that unstable markets, changes of jobs with Web3 and AI, 24-7 activity, marketing, and volatility all creates even, I would say, more of what we've seen in the past. And um, it's led us, me and my company, to talking a lot about FOMO, which is kind of this modern day anxiety, the fear of missing out. And that inspired us to do a project. And these are this is one creative way that we've approached this, um, bringing the community together to bring awareness of these conversations and action, um, is bringing up JOMO, the joy of missing out. So the JOMO effect is a campaign that Peace Inside Live spearheaded for Mental Health Awareness Month in May. Oddly enough, it's the last day of May, so happy Mental Health Awareness Month. And... Uh, we we basically wanted to talk about what's on the other side. Um, one, talk about FOMO, but also look at what's on the other side, the possibility around that. And so Jomo is the joy of missing out. And we brought together 40 artists who each created uh, art of what joy means to them. And through that, we did an NFT drop and raised uh, 
money for five mental health charities. We partnered with Time Pieces, Deepak Chopra's Save a Love. It was truly a community decentralized effort. We raised 16,000 Matic for those five charities. And I would say we did even more in terms of the amount of social press impressions and awareness around the cause. Um, and also the conversations we were having um, with different groups and communities, I would say in Twitter spaces and even offline was pretty remarkable. Um, really talking about what this um, space is bringing up for a lot of people and how do we create action? How do we put our money where our mouth is? And that's what we're challenging a lot of these companies and communities. If you're going to have people work in your company with your brand, engage with your community for a lot of their lives, are you going to support them in terms of where what's happening? Or are you going to leave them by the wayside when, as they say, shit hits the fan? And at Peace Inside Live and me personally, I feel like uh, modern day companies, all companies really have a responsibility um, to make tools for well-being accessible for everyone. Um, it's up to the government. But if the government's not going to do it, it's up to individuals and private companies. And uh, you know, and that and that's the reality. And we got to start taking um, taking responsibility for that because we are losing a ton of money because of mental health right now. People not being able to fully show up in their jobs, being their best self, feeling happy. And that's reality, even if we're going to look at it in a capitalistic way, which I hate, but we are losing money by not focusing on mental health. So it's a win-win for everyone. And all of this, the Jomo effect and, and the mint we did, um, is really creating a, a movement around the joy of missing out. Uh, we now have, and if you, oh, your logo Joseph, your logo is in my QR code. There you go. Um, you could buy the Jomo Journal now. We went from a virtual online movement to now something concrete that you could hold in your hand as well um, and practice the joy of missing out daily. So now we have this journal you can buy in it. You have prompts for morning and nighttime routines to help you create more intentions um, and really understand what joy means to you. Because again, when you, a lot of us understand what doesn't feel good, but we tend to not focus on what does feel good and creating the space to figure out what that is for us versus letting people uh, control that and everything external from us. And so uh, the Jomo Journal is a daily practice for the joy of missing out. We also have featured some of our artists of our NFT art in there and through the book, the journal, you could also buy that art and support our mental health charities, but it's inspiration for you along your journey as well. Um, and our hope through this is to one, uh, bring the Jomo movement to events, conferences, galleries around the world, showcase the art, which, you know, art is a universal language and it creates a conversation and um, an experience of like what you want to feel in your life. Um, and then we also want to um, bring our FOMO to Jomo workshop to these spaces as well that I do with my co-founder, Jordana Reem, as well as the, the Jomo journal. And so overall through the work we're doing, um, I think what we're, what I'm showing is that in this modern world, it's not just about focusing on um, digital and our well-being. We get to bring those things together individually as um, a space that inspires um, autonomy and individuality, but we get to do that in community as well. And that's the future that I see and that I'm working to build. So you can go back and follow me everywhere. That's my alpha newsletter, that QR code. Um, it's been great hanging out and being here with all of you and sharing my journey. If you have any questions or want to share anything, let me know. Thank you, Joseph, for having me. And I hope this uh, inspired you in some way. Well, the, this, the audience loved it uh, as well. And, uh, you know, it was great to hear your story. And, um, and I've never heard the full story. And, and I love the story. And what I love about it is, so I've taken a very, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a controversial point of view, which is I've set my sights. That's why I'm wearing the Target 
over here. I've set my sights on Web 2. I don't believe Web 2 has been good for the world, has been good for society, has been good for mental health. And I kind of like what you said. It's, an, it's a unique take, which is that it was really hard to be a creator and monetize because the rug kept the rug the rug kept on getting pulled the the algo kept on changing the centralized players kept on making it really hard for creators to build consistently enter web 3 so i would love for you to talk a little bit about i mean do you see web 2 uh, as the enemy do you see web 3 as the kind of salvation to web 2 or do you see it more as a kind of an and 2 plus 3 equals i don't know 6 no, I just see it as an evolution, right? If like, I think that the more we create these like characters and tension and enemy and like the savior complex, like the the more we're losing track of like what the tech and how it's applicable, what it can do. Uh, because then we, we start again, creating these characterizations around these things. And the minute something rug pulls or the minute there's something bad around it, like bad actors, it becomes like, oh, it's wrong and it doesn't work. Um, when we go back to why the tech was built in the first place versus maybe some of the things that have happened, we can understand more so why it's here and why people are continuing to build on it. So I, I'm trying to take more of a pragmatic and practical approach in saying like, again, I understand why Web2 happened and it was an evolution. Mm. However, you know, and some people like, you know, YouTube's partner program, it was created by someone who um, really did create the foundation for how creators can monetize, but companies decided not, and even YouTube decided not to really move forward with it, which I think was a detriment um, because it didn't create a win-win and it created a toxic dynamic between tech platform and creative creator, right? Um, and then legacy media companies and um, and it it created a lot of friction and tension. And so I think I, I I see what's happening even now with the minting platforms and marketplaces. It's the same thing, right? They're going back to what's quickly going to work and make money via trading. And that doesn't necessarily work for the artists and the creatives. And I don't think it's about letting go of that, but you got to approach each project, each individual thing differently. So you you have maybe maybe your project managers for like legacy media companies coming in and like big celebrities. You have them for like more of the emerging artists. And then you have maybe someone managing more of the PFP or DGEN projects. And each of them have best practices, but there's a different approach and a different community depending on, you know, what you're building mm. and why. Um, and so I think creating these blanket models actually hurts every single industry because you're not really listening to why people are creating and what their needs are. And I'm seeing that happen here too, in many ways. Um, and again, this is still a bubble. So while um, it has the promise of community and ownership and cutting out the middleman or the middle person, sorry, um, in many ways, there still are in people in between you and that. There always will be, including as movements emerge, right? There's always be the, the yeah. influencers, the different players. And so uh, I, I, I think that Web 2 was a solution to what we saw in evolution. Like before Web 2, we had just dot coms. It was like, again, it was more about signups and um, – and it wasn't as much of a back and forth interactive conversation. It wasn't social. It wasn't based on content and video. Uh, and so we needed social networks to grow that, right? And to create use cases for that and allow us to connect. But the one thing they still didn't solve was this X factor of how um, or if they want to allow the people creating that to be part of the process. And so that's why, you know, Web3 was created to enable that through the blockchain and also allow consumers and the fans to have ownership as well. Everyone was part of it. And so I think that Web2 can actually turn that on pretty quickly if they wanted to. But the problem is, yeah, it would disrupt the models right now, which is why it's easier for just a new company to start it and build mm. on it. But they don't have the reach yet or the scale. So it's like we, we're kind of in this in-between 
Um, and there's it's also still not fully accessible and easy. The so, in between. We're in purgatory, yeah. the upside down. I don't know. Um, so that I'm, was like a long-winded answer to what you said. But I was like, Web2 has a target. It's like, okay, well, what does that actually mean? Like you could point fingers and all that, but I'm I want to focus on more action and focusing on the people making a difference. And that's what we could should put our energy on because that's uh wherever you put your energy is what grows and flows where right? there's that saying so if you're putting on your energy on the things not working you're going to find more of what's not working yeah you know you know one one of the reasons actually funnily enough why i love to uh always launch with the enemy thing is it gets such a beautiful reaction yeah of course you know and i love it i love it uh, I'm, I'm i still find it the enemy but here's what i wrote uh here's what i wrote down uh, this is, this is uh, you know, to uh, hat tip to you, Shira. Web2, you said, was a solution to an evolution. And then I added maybe oh, I love that. is I a love solution that. to a revolution. Look at that. We co-created a set. We did. We <laughs> did. Motto. Well, you know, you know, I have another one that I've been playing with, which, which is this one as well, which is from FOMO to JOMO to JOMU, which is the joy of messing up. Um, so, yeah. you know, you kind of, you, when, when you miss out, and you mess up and you actually find joy from it, guess what? You know, you live to fight another day and you do it with a smile on your face. Yeah, or the joy of being, like, uh, as as we've said in our workshop, we talk about the J-O-B-H, the joy of being here, because really the joy of missing out is this idea of, like, really just in presence and, like, knowing you're exactly where you need to be right now, which includes in the, like, the, the wins, the losses, everything in between, and the beauty and the mess ups, right? Like, there is still beauty there, right? Because that's where the learnings come from. And that's where the stories come from. Mm, no. no one like, no story has come from, you know, like how boring would it be to listen to someone just talking about how amazing their life was and how everything worked out perfectly? Exactly. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know when that happens to me. Uh, Rini, who was our speaker last week, said, I'm very much an introvert and have really leaned into Jomo and have been really honest with people around me and they appreciate the transparency. Yes, because yeah, you're allowing people to get to know who you really are. And then the right people will lean in and accept you and celebrate you and the wrong people, well, F them, right? It's like, I think the more you lean into your truth and who you are, um, it's a bit of a letting go of the people pleasing, the need for validation, and then you get the right people around you that deserve to be there. So Shira, I love I, that. I want to ask you a just a couple of questions before yeah. I forget. The first is you spoke at the, first of all, you actually created a, a, like a quite brilliant elevator pitch and it's not flashy. It's just basically matter of fact, you said, um, you said this idea of, of meeting people where they are and then using tech to facilitate and transform, et cetera. That, that is the, that's, that's basically brings you back to, to day one, which yeah. is this idea of, fish where the fish are, where are people, where is the puck heading, where is your customer, where are the creators, go to where they are, don't expect them to come to you, and then use technology to surprise and delight and to transform and to make magic. Yeah. So I, I really love that the essence of the way you put it. But at the beginning, you spoke about culture. What is the culture right now within Web3? And, and what should it be? Because it's certainly far from perfect. There, there is toxicity. There is fear. There is, there is a lot of negativity, which you are now countering as well. So chat a little bit about where are we and where do you believe we can be? And obviously the dot, dot, dot is with the help of the big brands, with the help of the Web2 personalities like yourself. So I would love for you to address that. Yeah, I think where we are depends on like where you are hanging out. Because like if you go in certain Twitter spaces, it's gross and disgusting, bro culture. People are every ism or ist. They're racist, sexist, homophobic. It's really bad. Go in some of those late night Twitter spaces and you're like, no, like I'm, I, I can't, you know, it's mind blowing. And these are people that are quote unquote influencers in this space. Like, no, thank you. We got to watch who we are giving the baton to influence. <laughs> um, and so I, but then on the other side, you go in other spaces where you're like, wow, this is really beautiful. Like there's some really amazing conversations happening or you're at some of these events. Like a lot of times I can get even discouraged uh, about the space, whether it be because of 
deal flow or what I'm seeing in the headlines, then you go to a, a conference or an event and you see people and you get that energy and you're like, wow, this is like a really fun community to be in where um, people are entrepreneurial, they're creative, um, they're looking to build something new and unique and um, create new paradigms. And that's like exciting and energizing. And so I, I think that it, yeah, and VCon, yeah, I, um, Anne Marie, that VCon was a, a great example of that. Um, where again, you could go to other events and be turned off, but then the right event, you could actually be onboarded and turned on. And so, kind of, you have to watch where you are and kind of ask yourself, like, does this represent the whole ecosystem? And um, a lot of the times, it doesn't necessarily just like VCon doesn't represent the whole ecosystem. It has a lot of positivity, but the whole ecosystem isn't mm. entirely positive. But let's choose where we want to put our energy, what we're going to focus on, and where we want to exist. Um, so that's where I think it is. I think that in Web3, ultimately, because it's all about the power of the individual and the creator and um ownership, it means you're going to see a lot more niche communities pop up for good and bad, right? There's a pro and con to that. And so that will, I think, spread us a bit thin, but also let the right people, quality people find each other and the rest can do whatever they want. And um, so that's what I think about that. And also during a bear market, obviously it's even a bit less, right? Mm. But I think there's still like, I don't know. I, I personally love it. I'm still energized and excited. And Again, having been early in the creator economy and digital media, I've seen si similar things. And so, but it does take, I would say, time and the and the right investments and resources into the space to kind of showcase what it can do. Mm. And I think in the end, it's not going to just be about what we thought it was. And we everyone says this about like the PFPs and these. Um, extreme communities where your maybe nft is worth like tons of money which is great but it also there was some lack of accessibility there and privilege that we show <laughs> i think that came up in that um but i think there's companies whether it be ticketmaster or starbucks with what they're doing that are really approaching it in a really interesting way like my perfect model that I see is scalability from some of these big companies, um, but then also them continuing to remain authentic to like the early adopter community. And I think there's ways to do that, right? Um, through leveraging their own platforms and traditional communities and creating a value add, it needs to make sense. It can't just be, you're going to use this because it's innovative or disruptive. Like people don't get that. It needs to make their lives better. So we just need to focus. Well, you, you're, you're, you're partly addressing the final question. And then, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to jump into Discord just maybe for 10 or 15 minutes just to start to experiment because these are alpha beta talks. The idea is 20 minutes of, of talking, uh, of 20 minutes of, of speaker talking, as in you, the speaker, 10-minute yeah. conversation with me, and then 30 minutes uh, town hall, which will be members only. But today we're going to experiment uh, a little bit talking about investment. That's kind of what I'm trying to build in in this safe, strategic, hands-on, exclusive but not excluding community. You're a member as well. You have a pass um, as as my way of saying thank you. Um, I want to ask you uh, a question, which I'm pioneering with you, Shira. I'm putting you on the spot, but Yay. you can do it. Amazing. Which is, which is okay. You are now talking directly to the CMOs, the chief marketing officers yeah. of every single Fortune 500 global 2000 company, they are, they want to hear from you. What is the message that you want to tell them? What's the one thing that you want them to know as it relates to Web3, investing in Web3, and where Web3 should ultimately be falling on their priorities? Yeah, I think that like what you saw on social media, a lot of companies relate to the game. They didn't want to invest. They didn't want to focus on innovation and they were late to the game. I think that you need to focus on your day to day. You know, you don't need to necessarily completely change the path of your ship, 
but you need to be aware of what's ahead or else you're going to uh, basically, you're going to land there and you'll self-destruct because you're going to end up, oh, it's like kind of uh, moving into the islands <laughs> instead of going there and visiting there and already having a plan. <laughs> Or the iceberg. Or the iceberg, right? Exactly. So uh, I think that now's the time to figure it out and experiment and don't put so much pressure on it, like th everything happening in a short period of time. Like I, again, I always think that every company should have the innovation and disruption division and the day to day, and they should feed into one another, but don't act like your disruption and innovation should be your day to day. When you figured that out, you need to be working like on both this. at once. And like, and that's the way you stay ahead of the game. That's the way that you're not left behind of all of this. And then you don't have to then buy companies in an, like in a fake way to stay cool and relevant. Like, I think we've seen companies like T-Mobile do this. Look at T-Mobile. T-Mobile is also doing a lot of stuff around, you know, web three, seeing companies like Allo Yoga, again, figure out ways to make it work for you in a way that adds value to your consumers and it will make sense for the future. And the same goes with not just Web3, but AI. I kind of batch it all together. Yeah. You know, digital disruption is here and it's happened in the past and it's continuing to happen. So how are you going to approach it? I, I, I think you deserve the air horn. As, as we conclude, remember big brands out there, Web 2 was a solution to an evolution. Web 3 is a solution to a revolution and, uh, and uh, the revolution will not be televised. What is the well? Revolution? Is that true? Is that true? I like, you know, I love that MTV moment, but Jill like, actually, I think the, the, the revolution is, um, simulcasted you know it's everywhere the revolution it's, will be streamed yeah it's like exactly. the revolution will be in discord the revolution will be co-owned by everyone by cheryl lazar and but don't, yeah Jeffy. exactly don't, don't be scared to let uh um, i would say your cons consumers be part of the process right because i think there's like more of a long-term win-win there yeah abs absolutely uh i will leave you as we as we jump into Discord for just a few moments with people that are online, uh, the revolution of community capitalism, the promise of Web3, shared values, shared ownership, and shared reward. Uh, Shira, thanks so much for uh, for being number two. And uh, I'll see you in Discord in just a few yes, moments. Yes, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.